Good morning. <laughs> Apparently we're ready. Now let's sit on this. We're going to sit over here. You can sit where you want to sit. You can see we've worked all of this out. Welcome to Manhattan Beach Community Church. No matter who you are and where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Even if you have no idea what's happening. Whew, luckily for me. It's a comma. My name is Mark Pettis, and I am privileged to serve as senior minister here at MBCC, and I welcome you this morning on behalf of myself, on behalf of Reverend Matthew Ball, who is back from the flu this week. So you will not see Reverend Ball in the receiving line. He's been told he's no longer contagious, but we're not taking any chances. And he will return to his plastic bubble in the back of the office later. And I welcome you on behalf of our worship assistant, Mike Zaro, this morning, who brought toys. So that's pretty exciting. Um, just a couple things uh, before we head into congregational currents. Uh, first thing is, there are blue pew pads on the inside edges of your pews. And I would invite you to find those and sign those and send them to the ends and bring them back to the middle. Um, also, just to review the order of how things work so we don't have any horrible bumps along the way. At the time of lighting of the candle of love, you see it's preceded by passing the peace. When the passing the peace is over, our esteemed organist, Lee Lasseter, will play just the melody from the song we'll sing at the end of the lighting, okay? So don't stand to sing. Don't worry about grabbing your hymnals right away. It's just the music it lets you know we're done with the passing the peace. Grab a seat. In love. Um, then we will do the lighting of the candle. Following that, we will have the singing of the song. You may remain seated for the singing of that particular song. Okay? We're all on the same page. We're good to go. And uh, we will move on. So with that, sir. Good morning, everyone. If you're new to Manhattan Beach Community Church this morning, a special welcome. We're a very well-organized church, despite what you just saw this morning. And um, uh, it, it, you also would uh, like, you, you would, uh, you've picked a very good time to be here uh, at Manhattan Beach Community Church. And uh, please uh, feel, uh, consider joining us for one of our three great uh, Christmas Eve services tomorrow. And then also, please join us today on the patio downstairs for coffee hour. Uh, if you have questions, I believe there's people with ribbons. There's me, there's Pastor Mark, there's Pastor Matthew. We've got a bunch of folks here to help. You know, I like that we call this currents, the congregational currents. It, it's, it fits our nautical theme for everything, right? But also a current is something that's somewhat hard to notice on the surface, right? And that's a very good metaphor for this church. So as I go through some of the things that... Uh, are in your bulletin today, I think it would be good for us to consider all that we do throughout the year, uh, our current, if you will. Um, for example, tomorrow, hundreds of people who don't regularly attend church, literally hundreds, will make this church part of their Christmas Eve service. And uh, we'll have a 5 p.m. one where we'll share our wonderful youth ministry. If you notice on the chancel steps, we had 62 children not just a few days ago, 62, which is larger than the average congregation in our conference. So wonderful ministry, a wonderful ministry. At 8 p.m., we'll have a traditional carol, best choir in the South Bay up there. We'll share their wonderful musical gifts with, uh, with, with the community. And then at 11, uh, the youth will continue their uh, Christmas service. You know, they were out at 1736 House giving presents uh, earlier in the week, and they'll continue their Christmas service with, uh, uh, with um, uh, sharing their musical talents at 11 o'clock. We'll be taking special offerings. Last year, the special offerings raised thousands of dollars for fire victims. We did an alternative Christmas fair. Last year, this Christmas fair raised thousands upon thousands of dollars, shelter locally and abroad. Uh, so, if you're also looking at some of the stuff, we have an adult discussion group next week, December 30th, Examination of Ode to Joy. There's a great ministry that, again, we share with the community. Uh, Mariners uh, has their Christmas, New Year's Eve party. Uh, check your bulletin. Uh, tens of thousands of dollars for things like church upgrades, including the new church upgrade that's coming up 
They raise, uh, oh, uh, Women's Fellowship has, uh, you know, all women are part of Women's Fellowship. All women in this church are part of Women's Fellowship, right? Am I right on that? All right, and then they're, and they're meeting on uh, <laughs> January 30th, uh, and they raise thousands upon thousands of dollars every year for schooling, shelter, medical research. Uh, we will be continuing our longstanding focus on family uh, with uh, Family Camp, February 16 to 18. This is super popular, sign up. We started Caring Ministries, right? Uh, another service to community, and you know we have uh, our, our uh, counseling center, which offers low-cost uh, mental health services to many members of the community throughout the, uh, throughout the South Bay. Uh, we're also a major contributor to UCC's, our church's wider mission, uh, me teaching ministries in Laos, Africa, China, and then we also continue our service ministries, teaching right here with reading ministries. So if you're a little stressed out about whether you got the right gift under the tree or whether you know, you're bringing the right hors d'oeuvre to Christmas Eve or whatever, stress not. 365 days a year, you truly live out uh, the mission of Christmas. Uh, in this congregation, and I'm proud to be part of it. It's a shame that Mike has no enthusiasm for the life of our church. <laughs> nice job. Uh, each Sunday, as we gather to worship together, we gather to worship God, to reconcile ourselves with God through the act of worship, through song, through prayer, through community. But we begin by first reconciling with one another. And we do that in our church through the tradition of passing the peace. And so at this time, I would invite all of us here to turn and greet our neighbors with a word of peace. Good morning. We're the McIntyre family, minus Papa Bear Jason, who unfortunately works on Sundays in the winter. So I'm hoping that he'll be around in the spring and summer. This is my firstborn, Bryce. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> and this is my daughter, Bryn. She just turned six a couple days ago. And I'm Amy. <laughs> And we're new members here, and we're really thrilled about that. And I'm going to read this to everyone. And so I'm really appreciative that we were asked to um, speak today and light the candle of love on the Advent wreath. So I was trying to think of what I could possibly say about love. And I thought about the love languages. I don't know if you're familiar with them. But the theory goes that people have a primary and a secondary love language. And that they give love in the way that they like to receive love through that language. Spouses often have different love languages. And if one is not aware of this and your spouse's preferred love language, expressions of love for one another may get lost in translation. The five love languages are words of affirmation, verbally communicating that you love someone and how and let me count the ways, quality time, doing something with the one you love and giving them your undivided attention, 
giving and receiving of gifts, really thinking about something meaningful, finding some obscure, wonderful thing that they didn't even know, but when they get it, mind blown. Acts of service, doing something for you, your loved one that you know they would appreciate. And physical touch, hugging, hand holding. So I thought, let's pivot to Love Languages Christmas Edition. We are in the home stretch. Christmas is two days away, and this year I am challenging myself to see all the Christmas minutia for what it is. It's the people in my life and your life saying, I love you. When you get a gushy Christmas card that may not exactly be your cup of tea, telling you you are the best husband or son or uncle in the world, that's someone's way of saying, I love you. When you arrive at your mother's house and she's already exhausted before you even get there because she's been cleaning the house the whole time, getting it ready for you, that's her way of saying, I love you. Um, when your spouse asks to go walk down Candy Cane Lane when you're already way too busy and you've seen Candy Cane Lane every year for the past five years and you can see it in your mind when you close your eyes. That's their way of saying, I love you. When you get a gift and someone insists on always just surprising you year after year instead of just asking you what it is that you want, the thought that they're putting into that gift is their way of saying, I love you. So, I'm challenging myself this year to look at all the chaos and the madness on our busy to-do list as a chance for us and our friends to convey to each other, I love you. And let's try to make all that we must do in the coming days be a reflection of our love. And may we receive crumbly cookies, interesting gifts, light display tours, as the love it is intended to convey. After all, the whole reason for this season and for the whole reason we're doing all of this is for God so loved the world. Let us freely receive and share God's love and our love for one another this Christmas. And with that, I think we'll head over and do this. Please uh, grab your bulletins and join me in the call to worship. As we draw near to Christmas, our anticipation of what is to come grows. We look ahead to the coming of Christ into the world and all that he brings. In this time of worship, let us celebrate the wonderful promise of Christ. Often read in Advent, Psalm 89 celebrates God's promise to establish the holy empire through the lineage of David. And here it is. We sing, the Lord's, we sing of the Lord's great love forever. With our prayer, we make your faithfulness known through all generations. We declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, 
my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. The heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is most high. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. They celebrate your righteousness. Join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. seated, I would invite the children up for some time with our Minister of Faith Formation, Sylvia.
Well, good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing today? Good. Well, as you might have guessed by the color of my hair, my favorite color in the entire world is purple. Yeah, absolutely. If your favorite color is purple, raise your hand. Awesome. So that means I can only be friends with those who have their hands raised, right? No. I can be everyone's friend, even if we don't like the same color, even if we don't like the same music, even if we don't like the same baseball teams, go Cubs, uh, we can still be friends, right? Yeah, actually, in fact, absolutely. Even as Christians, we are told to be in community with people who are different than us. People who might act differently, who might look differently, who might like different colors, different music, who might even like the Dodgers. We're told to be in community with them. So today we're gonna finish off our nativity over here. And as I'm gonna have you guys stay right where you are because there's a lot of you today. Now I'm gonna finish off the nativity over here. And I want you to think about all the different types of people that we have in our church community, who we might have in our neighborhoods, who we might have at our schools, who we might have in the entire world, the different, different people who make up all of our communities, just like all the different people who are at Jesus' birth and all the different animals from uh, a little donkey all the way up to a camel. All of these different people were at Jesus' birth, just like we're all called to be in a community together. So if you guys can watch me, I don't want you guys coming up here because we have fire. So if you want to come up right up here, but don't get on this stair, okay? All right, so I'm going to move. We have, who is this? An angel. We have angel at Jesus' birth. That just fell. And who's this? A shepherd. And we have another shepherd. And what's this? A cow. A cow. And a Camel. Oh my goodness, so many people of different shapes and sizes. And what's this one? Donkey and another camel. All right. We're almost done with our nativity. What are we missing? Well, we're missing the Magi, but who comes first? Jesus. When does Jesus come? Tomorrow or Christmas. Jesus comes on Christmas. The white candle. Good job, Riley. Like All right. So can you guys pray with me? All right. I want you to repeat after me. Creator God, as we add the animals, the angel, and shepherd to the stable on the last day of Advent, We remind ourselves to prepare with peaceful community for the coming of Christ. Amen. All right, you guys can go ahead and head out to Sunday school.
As we come to our whoa, <laughs> as we come to our time of uh, prayer, we'd like to lift up all those who are in our thoughts and uh, hold them close as we pray. We'd like to keep in mind um, Jean Schaefer, and as part of our uh, participation in the World Community in the World Council of Churches Ecumenical Prayer Cycle, the peoples of Japan, North Korea, South Korea and Taiwan, and all these others who we name now. Ann Burroughs, Mommy and Daffy Burroughs, and Phil Burroughs. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we come together in this season of light and hope and joy and love, we give you thanks for all these blessings and for the chance to celebrate them. We ask your special blessing on those whose lives have too little of them. For those who are rejected and outcast, for those who struggle with violence and poverty and a lack of acceptance, be with them, comfort them, protect them, heal them. Be with us as well. As you have blessed us with so many things, give us one more blessing. Teach us to share all the blessings you have given with others, that your kingdom may truly come, that your will may truly be done on earth just as it is in heaven. We ask this in the name of Christ, who we remember as our newborn or almost newborn Savior. Amen. The last time we were together on Advent, uh, we shared in the Advent according to Matthew a story about the literally unsung hero that is Joseph. But at least Joseph is included in the nativity scene, and you know, he'll be here at 5 o'clock tomorrow. Today's unsung hero has no such place in the Christmas pageant. The expansion pack for the Fisher-Price nativity scene up here does not include a camel hair wearing John the Baptist. And that's really unfortunate in light of what we learn today in today's uh, scripture. You know, in the Eastern tradition, John's cousin is revered as John the Forerunner, which is a, a more apt appellation in my view because the breadth of John's ministry, as we learn today, is extraordinary. He even draws soldiers into his ministry. So to the extent John comes off pretty harsh in this scripture, keep that occupation in mind. Keep that the fact that Nazareth was under persecution by the Roman army, and John's home province of Galilee uh, was oppressed by Herod and his own people as tax collectors. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, 
And we, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered them all by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So, with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. Will you join me in a moment of silent reflection on those uplifting words? <clears throat> Amen. So one of the things that I miss about um, television with the advent of streaming services and the DVR and most particularly my wife's uh, unwillingness um, when we do DVR things is uh, commercials. She is not a fan of the commercial and therefore we fast forward through all commercials when we DVR and of course on streaming you don't have commercials. Now I spent a couple of years working for a public affairs consulting firm which is just this side of a marketing firm and so I truly value the, 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 the viewing of commercials um, when I can watch them. When I'm watching television by myself, I watch all the commercials at full volume. <laughs> For me, it's not really about the products and the feeling of desire to, to acquire them. I mean, I'm as much a consumer as the next person, but, but really I'm more intrigued to try to determine what the, the target demographic is for the commercials and explore the approaches that the companies are taking and that their, their ad companies are suggesting to appeal to those target audiences. For instance, why do they air all of the truck and nutritional supplement commercials on ESPN in the morning when I'm working out? I know what you're thinking, this is a strange place to start a sermon about love in the later stages of the season of Advent, although given the blatant commercialization of, of Christmas, maybe not. But anyway, bear with me. This time of year, no matter what channel you are watching or even on social media, like Facebook, we are bombarded with messages and commercials that attempt to play into the nostalgia of the season. Why are we somehow more susceptible to such messages at Christmas time? This past week I watched a video that has been making its way around Facebook this past month. It may or may not be an advertisement, I haven't really figured it out yet, but it's a series of people who lack the ability to see color. And they are being given glasses that allow them to see color for the first time in their lives. The reactions are beautiful to witness as they are overwhelmed by the beauty of even the simplest things now seen in color. I mean, imagine seeing color for the first time. I am not a terribly emotional person, but I could feel the tears welling up as I watched each person react to this moment of revelation. Then one morning while I was working out and watching ESPN, a car commercial came on, not surprising. Except this time it was not a commercial about all the powerful trucks you can buy. Instead, it started off with a little boy watching who I presume was his mother drive away. And as soon as she drove away, he started building a snowman. And then he invited all of his friends to start building snowmen with him, giving him very specific instructions. Should be out this high. And then you see an entire neighborhood building snowmen around the street. And then it shifts to that car coming back into the neighborhood, this time with a passenger. And as they enter the neighborhood, 
the passenger notices a series of snowmen along the road, each one facing the street with stick arms in a salute. And the passenger is in the military. And then it pulls up in front of the house, and standing next to the final snowman is the little boy himself saluting, as who I presume his father gets out of the car, and they hug. It is a, uh, it's a moving commercial. All of this, as you might imagine, got me thinking, not just about the marketing approaches of these commercials, but about what they are designed to appeal to in us, the consumer. Perhaps it's nothing more than nostalgia or an attempt to bring a little happiness into our lives. But I think it's more than that. I believe the reason such messages resonate is because they demonstrate love. And not simply affection, but something much deeper than that. And that speaks to something inside each of us. There are plenty of jewelry commercials on this time of year when one person is giving another a gift of a bracelet or a necklace or earrings. The response of the recipient is always very nice as mutual affection is on full display. And don't get me wrong, a bracelet and necklace and earrings are perfectly fine gifts. I myself have an appreciation for watches. But the kind of gifts being given in those other moments that I just spoke of are something different. And the love that these commercials demonstrate is more than just affection. It is fair to say that just as it is strange to start off a sermon talking about commercials, it may be equally strange to start off where our passage starts off this week. You brood of vipers! Perhaps we could soften that. You brood of vipers! Fa la 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 la. Yet our passage continues, and the tenor of John does not really change. It is intense, shall we say. And the ultimate message is something I believe points to a similar form of love for the people, as do these tear-jerking commercials of this season. John is calling on people to think not only of themselves and the more that they want, but to consider the needs of others. Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. And to the tax collectors themselves, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. In a culture then, not dissimilar from now, where concern for self can trump all else, it is a call to look to the needs of others and to consider the feelings of others. More than that is a call to empathy. And that, my friends, is something we sorely need in our time. For empathy, in this sense, and on this occasion, serves as the foundation for the kind of love we celebrate today. The kind of love that motivates seasonal commercials. The kind of love that undergirds the entire message of the gospel. It's the kind of love that goes far beyond simple affection, demonstrated through the gifting of a trinket. In this case, love is wanting for others what we want for ourselves. A sense of fullness. A sense of wholeness. It's not wanting more, but wanting enough. In the case of that video promotion I saw on Facebook, this sense of love rejoices in the moment when someone who has, by circumstance, been unable to witness the incredible beauty of this world, when they are miraculously made able to see in full color the fullness of God's creation. You see how meaningful this gift can be as the recipients, one after another, break down in tears for the beauty that they are witnessing for the first time. And we feel in our hearts a sense of gratitude on their behalf. That is love, my friends, when we wish for others to see the beauty in the world around them, when we wish for them to be made whole. In the case of the car commercial I saw on ESPN, which really was not about a car at all, the sense of love expresses itself in a moment of honor and reunion. 
Honestly, a heartfelt reunion might just be enough to sell cars as we are moved by the rush of emotion when a child is reunited with their parent who has been away. But in this case, there's so much more. For the one coming home is simultaneously welcomed home and honored as their sacrifice is recognized, filling what can so often be a great gap. They are both made whole as the fracture of their family is repaired and the distance of separation is overcome. But more than that, the returning hero is made whole as his sacrifice is acknowledged and his service is celebrated. And we who are watching are moved to tears, if not motivated to buy a car. That is love, my friends. When we wish for others to be reunited with their loved ones and reminded that their sacrifices, their service, is appreciated. When we wish for them to be made whole. This is the love represented by the candle we lit this morning. It's the love that served as the foundation for Jesus', Jesus life and ministry. The motivation of God's gift of Christ altogether. A child is sent into a fractured world to bring healing and wholeness to that world. And the message of that child as he grows into adulthood echoes throughout the ages, speaking to the brokenness in all people, in every generation, offering a promise of wholeness in relationship with God and with God's people. It's a message that echoes still today as we confront the brokenness of our time, as we look around and see those for whom wholeness is fleeting, those who have experienced loss, those who are struggling with illness, those who are grasping for meaning, those who are overcome by anger. We see this lack of wholeness across our nation and our world in those whose communities are plagued by violence those who go without enough to eat, those who are without homes. Perhaps we even see and feel this lack of wholeness in ourselves, my friends. Yet in the face of this emptiness, we are reminded that such brokenness is not the last word, for God desires for us all wholeness. And the promise of Christ is for the kind of love that brings just that into our lives. There's a song first recorded in 1965 by Jackie DeShannon. And I'm guessing most of you know it. It goes something like this. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for you, but for everyone. We live in a world where there truly is enough for everyone. And loving another in the way that Christ calls us to love is not wanting more for them, but rather wanting enough. Wanting them to be whole. This is what the world needs. And I believe that deep down, this is what we truly desire for others. It is why a stranger receiving glasses so that they can see colors moves us. It is why a series of saluting snowmen causes our eyes to well up. It is why we know in our hearts that there is enough for everyone. And should we have an extra coat or have extra food or some extra money, we feel moved to share it. Not because the ad gurus are encouraging it or because John the Baptist said so or because Jesus taught us, but because God first loved us in this way, desiring wholeness for all of God's people. And so we love others in the same audacious manner. For my friends, love is more than just affection. It is desire that all God's people may be made whole. And it is the actions that we take to make that dream a reality in our time for all people. Amen.
There was a family on the way home from church. Mother, father, son, and daughter, and the father, wondering, uh, noticing the quiet in the car, said, so how did, how did everybody enjoy church today? How did you enjoy Sunday school, he said to his son. And his son said, eh, I don't know. The lessons seemed kind of lame, and the teacher seemed kind of distracted. I, I, I should emphasize right now that this was not our church. <laughs> And the father said, well, yeah, maybe it's something going around because the, the, the sermon was just flat. Just, this really was not our church. No. <laughs> and the mother said, yeah, it really, and the choir, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Absolutely not our church, I promise. The daughter looked around at all of them and said, what do you expect for five bucks? <laughs> we have many blessings here from our Sunday schools to the preaching to the choir. Worship with our gifts and offerings appropriately. Once again, thank you, Lee and Sammy, for a beautiful offertory, and we 
I think we have a little more. I think Sammy might play something else for us before he goes today. So that's pretty good. So let's give them a pro- uh, appreciation for that. Thank you. Please join me in the prayer of dedication that appears in your bulletin. Each day brings us closer to our joyous celebration of Jesus' birth, O God. Help us to remain present in this moment so that we might appreciate the gifts of now. Bless this offering as an expression of that gratitude as we seek to be a part of the fulfillment of your promises in our world. Amen. want to reiterate the invitation that Mike made earlier for everyone to come and join us at one or more of the services tomorrow at five o'clock, which is centered around a children's pageant, the eight o'clock, which is uh, music rich, uh, two choir anthems, a soloist, a string quartet, um, carols. It's, it, there's even a little sermon in there, just a little one, I sneak it in between songs. Or the 11 o'clock, which is our youth and young adult-led um, candlelight service here. And even if it's just because you're someone who can't stand not to, to, to finish something, and you've been watching this one candle wait to be lit, we do that tomorrow night. It's very exciting. Please uh, join us for our Christmas celebration tomorrow night. We are encouraged to love one another, to love, to wish for each person a sense of wholeness in their lives. Love the people, love the earth, love the universe, and do nothing that violates the God in you or the unity that exists, though it remains unseen. Amen.